Good afternoon, everybody. We are here with the Dr. Josh Wymore, who is a has a doctorate in philosophy, right, from Penn State University. That's right. And you are the owner of Josh Wymore Consulting yep. and doing a whole bunch of other things among parenthood and being a husband <laughs> and all of that other stuff. So we greatly appreciate you coming from northern Indiana to come out here, be with us, talk through this humility paradox, which you gave a talk on this a few weeks ago. Unbelievable. You guys are definitely in for a treat on this. Um, humility is a major part of leadership. So with that, Josh, enjoy, have fun. Everybody, enjoy it. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Thank you all for coming today, for attending virtually, and uh, for the thousands of you who are here in person as well. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about me. My name is Josh Wymore. Uh, as, a, as a leader developer, my job is to help leaders actually get traction, get results, do things a little bit differently. And so we'll be talking about what you can actually do to become a more humble leader today. Not just what leadership is in, in theory, but really in practice, how do you actually become a more humble leader? Why is it important and what do you do about that? Um, so uh, just a little bit about me, you, you're probably asking, okay, who is this Josh Wymore guy and is he humble? And if so, if he's not, why should we be listening to him? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I am not uh, the most humble practitioner, okay? I'm a, I'm a student of humility. I've, I've studied leadership and seen how humility works and the times when we don't have humility and how f far off track that gets. But at best, humility is like a second language for me, you know, like, a, like an ESL. So my hope is that as a second language practitioner, I can maybe see it from the outside a little more objectively and help you understand the rules of humility, the process of humility. Um, but uh, I definitely still have plenty of room to grow in, in that journey towards humility. But hopefully it can give you some insights today. But let me start by just sharing a little bit about when I became fascinated with humility. Uh, it was several years ago, and it was this young beardless pup uh, in college, a sophomore in college. And I was not humble by any stretch of the imagination. I was pretty arrogant, I'm a pretty naturally cocky kind of guy, and that was me at the time. And I met this guy, uh, his name is Brad. And Brad was taking over our softball team. I was the assistant softball coach in my university and uh, we were a, a terribly dysfunctional team, <laughs> and I was a big part of the reason for the dysfunction. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Maybe when you hear me say I was assistant coach, you think, wow, Josh, you must have a, a ton of softball experience, right, to be assistant coach in college. No, I was a warm body. I was willing to work pretty cheap. And literally, I had two half years, uh, half seasons of high school baseball and like a year of church league softball. That was all of my softball experience to date. So I was not qualified, quite frankly, to be the coach. So I thought to myself, why would anyone want to listen to me and follow me and believe me if I don't have enough experience? I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll just be super confident, right? I'll just, I'll seem like I know what I'm doing. And if they trust that, you know, I'm confident, then they'll totally get behind me. And as you can imagine, that actually did not work out very well. That these very seasoned athletes who had spent, you know, a decade playing softball could kind of tell that this kid didn't really know what he was talking about. So it just, it was a mess. I'm, I'm trying to be confident. I'm kind of being arrogant. They're pulling me apart and it's just, it's, it's awful. So into this situation walks Brad and my first interaction with Brad, I'm thinking this guy's going to get eaten alive because Brad's super chill. He's really laid back. He's not confrontational. I'm thinking with these strong personalities, you've got to kind of beat him back into their corner. And that's the opposite of Brad. I think he's going to get run over. But fast forward a few months, Brad's, you know, been doing it. Things have been going fine. And uh, after practice one day, I'm cleaning up putting balls and bats away, and uh, Brad's in the dugout talking to some of the players, and I don't think anything of it, but I see them walking away a few minutes later, and they kind of have this dazed and confused look on their face, and I stopped them and asked, hey, ladies, what's going on? And they said, well, we just had this conversation with Coach, and it's really strange because he was really nice to us, but he said these really difficult things for us to hear, and I couldn't really be mad at him. I, I don't know. I'm just not sure what to think about it. It was just, they were kind of hypnotized, and I just kind of laughed it off. I thought it was funny, and you know, they, they went home. So a couple weeks later, coach asked me to stay after practice. And he wants to talk to me. And so we, we sit down in the dugout and he starts asking me some questions about a particular player that I'd been butting heads with a little bit. And he's, you know, being really gracious, but he's starting to kind of probe this issue and, and help me realize like, wow, I've, I've really been kind of a jerk to this player. And as he's doing it, I'm thinking on two levels. Number one, I'm hearing what he's saying and thinking about the issue. But number two, I'm thinking he's doing that magic humble thing. Like he's saying these really difficult things, but in this really nice way. And so I can't really be mad at him. And I gotta figure this out, man, this guy's got a superpower. How do I get that? And so he finished and basically told me I was being a jerk, needed to grow up, needed to mature, and I hugged him because I, I, I just loved the conversation. It was so nice, I could tell that he cared so much about me. 
And I left thinking, I have got to figure this thing out. Whatever Jedi mind trick he has, I got to figure that out. Well, fast forward a few years, read an incredible book called Good to Great by Jim Collins, right? One of the best selling business books of all time, written in 2001. And if you remember from Good to Great, Collins studies these companies that made the leap from mediocre, from good to great. And they outperformed the market by seven times. Okay, so let's just like let that sink in for a second. They had seven times more revenue, seven times more profit, seven times better stock price than their peers that were basically the same. Can you imagine just for a second having seven times more salary, <laughs> seven times more of whatever it is you want? Like th th there's something incredible at this. And uh, you know, Collins really shook up the business world whenever he, he brought this forth. Um, and we've kind of forgotten about it a little bit, right? We're not bringing this back up and setting it all the time. And I think there's a missed opportunity here because one of the key factors, if you read Good to Great, if you remember this, is that one of the differentiators across all these companies was humble leadership. The level five leadership is what he called it. It's this really exceptional, really surprising factor. Collins actually w was trying to ignore this. He did not think that leadership was gonna be a differentiating factor. He told his research team, no, I don't pay attention to that. But it came, coming back over and over again, that humble leadership was a significant differentiator for these companies. And so my question is, this is 20 years ago, if, if humble leadership really makes this big of a difference, why aren't all of us like crazy focused on that? Why isn't that like the top thing on our leadership development plans, like become a more humble leader? Collins doesn't really dig deeply into this and explain you know, what's behind that, and that's kind of where I want to pick it up today is, okay, so, we, so Collins identifies this as a point that, that's a differentiator. What do we do with this? How do we become a humble leader? And first, we have to understand what is humble leadership because I think most of our ideas of humble leadership does not line up with leading a company to seven times its performance, right? It's kind of more in the background. So what's going on here, and how can we practically become a more humble leader. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Number one, what is humble leadership? Let's define it. Let's get a really clear definition there. Number two, why it is important. And number three, how do I actually develop it? So first, what is humility and humble leadership? Clearly, the, this good to great stuff is not quite your mom's idea uh, of humility. I think this is where most of us start with, with humility, right? We think about the doormat guy, the person who gets walked all over. We think about words like humiliation or shame or insecurity, right? It's, it's the person who doesn't really want to be in the spotlight because, you know, they're, oh, they're just meek and mild and in the background and, and, you know, really cautious. You know, pushovers. Like, you think about this, and this is obviously not something that most of us would want to aspire to, right? This is not a very attractive image. And it also doesn't seem to fit with, again, what these companies accomplished under, under these leaders. And so what's the difference? What, how is our definition of humility off? Well, here's a different picture of what humility could look like. Uh, how many of you recognize the, the, the faces and the names on this screen, no? Okay. What about the companies? Have you ever heard of any of these companies? Okay, heads are nodding, yes. So these are just four of the level five leaders that Collins identifies in good to great. And I think it's really telling that we remember the company's names, but we don't remember the leader's names. Let's just think about that for just a second. As a testament to their humble leadership, one, one of the, the, these leaders said, you know, when talking about one of his peers who was leading another, another organization who was really well known for his flashiness and being in the media, and he said, you know, he's a show horse, I'm a plow horse. Maybe some of you remember that. He's a show horse, I'm a plow horse. Just think about that as a, as a metaphor. How many CEOs do you know that would call themselves a plow horse? Not many, but these guys did. These are the words that Collins used to describe them. And actually, these aren't Collins' words. These are words that other people use to describe them. They're gracious. They're mild-mannered. They're self-aware, quiet, genuine, company-focused, modest, self-effacing. So we see some parallels with the previous slide, right? Like, it's not about them. You know, they do, they do have this more self-aware sense of modesty, but it's also not that they're getting run over, right? Being genuine is very different from being a pushover. Being mild-mannered is very different from, you know, being afraid to step into the limelight. These are the words that Collins and, and the researchers use to describe them. And just think about this for, for a second. Have you ever worked with a leader like this? What was that like? Right? It's such a different experience. And uh, as Andy Stanley says, maybe, you know, this is not something that we want for ourselves, but we want it for everyone else, right? Maybe I don't want to be humble, but I wish all of you would be humble. My life would be better, right? And so how do we turn the mirror back and say, okay, if this is what I want in others, how can I be this in myself? So let's move a little bit closer towards this definition of what humility and humble leadership is. The, the first words in, uh, in Rick Warren's 35 million copy selling book, uh, The Purpose Driven Life, is it's not about you. And this is intrinsically tied to humility. Uh, humble leaders are, are not 
uh, just afraid to take a stand, afraid to be in the limelight. But, but, but they realize when they do that, it's not about them. It's about something bigger than them. It's not about you. This is a really fundamental idea. Again, you think about, think about those leaders we looked at. We recognize the company's names, but not their names. Their companies succeeded, even though we may never know who they were, right? Because plow horses, we don't build statues to plow horses, right? We build statues to show horses. And for them, it was about something bigger than them. Our Purpose Point founder has a quote that's along the very similar lines. He says, choose to be the spotlight rather than be in it. So the, diff- the, the issue is not that, you know, no one should be in a spotlight anywhere, right? We shouldn't have a spotlight. No, it's where are we pointing the spotlight? Is it my job as a leader to point the spotlight on myself or on the people who are doing great work around me, on the company's mission, on what our customers are achieving? When you're the spotlight for other people, it's amazing uh, the things that you accomplish and the people who rally around that purpose. So m- moving now a little bit closer into that, that final definition, this is how I define humble leadership, and I'll explain it here in a second. Humble leadership is the gracious pursuit of a greater purpose. Now, if you've been following along, you're thinking, okay, whoa, you went from like being modest to greater purpose. Like, hold on, like slow down, back up, what's going on? So let me just explain this a little bit. And I'll start at the end and work my way back. So first is the greater purpose, okay? Humility is fundamentally uh, uh, captured in that Rick Warren quote that it's not about you, you know? As C.S. Lewis says, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking about yourself less. There's something outside of you that's bigger than you. That's what humility starts with, is recognizing it's not about me, Okay? The, the, the second part of this is the pursuit. So, you know, you may think of a humble person as maybe a monk who kind of sits in a monastery and is quiet and prays all the time, and that's great. They probably are very humble. But if you think about humble leadership, you're in pursuit of something. You're leading people somewhere. So you're not just a Zen master in a desert. You're taking people on a journey somewhere. You're in pursuit of a purpose. And then the third word is really the linchpin, and that's the graciousness piece. This goes back to the words that, that Collins used to describe those leaders, right? They're modest. They're self-aware. They recognize what they're really good at. Humble leaders are actually not sh- shy. They're not you know, afraid to step up and do anything. They're very cognizantly aware of their strengths. But they're just as aware, if not even more aware, of their weaknesses. They recognize when they don't have it all together. And here's what happens when you hold those two things in tension, when you have a really clear idea of what your strengths are and a really concrete idea of what your weaknesses are. First of all, if I can accept that about myself and just say, hey, you know what? I struggle here. I know I'm great here. Once I can accept myself, and, and then I stop trying to hide that stuff. Once I stop trying to hide it, I can actually get better at it. And just think about that. If everyone that you knew was self-aware of their weaknesses and was trying to get better, how would that fact alone change your culture tremendously, right? It would be huge. But you build out that foundation of self-awareness, and I start to do it for other people and think, wait a second, this person now, yeah, they have these incredible strengths, and they also have some weaknesses. How can I leverage their strengths, draw their strengths in actually to complement my weaknesses because I recognize that I need help from other people, right? I don't have to appear like I've got it all together because I've just accepted that I've got limitations as a human being. But I also see their weaknesses, and I see those weaknesses, and I think, you know what? They have weaknesses, but oh my gosh, so do I, right? We, we all need some help, right? We're all limited. And so from that common place of I accept them, I, I accept myself, even as I'm working, we're pursuing, we're moving towards something better, I don't have to just, you know, beat you down and make you pretend like you've got it all together. Because I get we're all broken, we're all fallible, we're all limited people. So as you're pursuing this purpose, this is what Collins found that the tension was, is that there was this modesty with this kind of ardent discipline, this drive. At the same time, it's this paradox. This is the heart of the humility paradox, the humble leadership paradox, is that you're both very gracious but also driven to accomplish something. But you're driven to accomplish something bigger than yourself. It's not about me looking good. It's not about me pumping up myself. It's about us accomplishing the mission. You go back to my, my conversation with Brad, and this is what Brad was doing in that conversation with me. For him, the, the graciousness was clear, right? It wasn't, you know, beating me down or <clears throat> making me feel inferior. It was a very loving conversation, a way of trying to address this issue. And he pursued it, right? He asked me to stay behind. He, he took that step. But the greater purpose, what was the greater purpose in that conversation? It wasn't a self-centered purpose. It wasn't Brad saying, well, I'm going to throw my weight around and show him who's boss, right? That would have been a self-centered way, and you can just imagine how that conversation would go. But for him, I think Brad had a couple of purposes. I think one of his purposes was he wanted a really high-functioning team. That was his purpose. And he knew to have a high-functioning team, I've got to address this dysfunction. I think one of his purposes is he wanted to strengthen me as a leader. He cared about me as a person and wanted to see me be a better version of myself. And so if I care about the success of the team and the success of the person, I'm not going to go into the conversation the way I feel like going to the conversation, right? 
I mean, you can think about this when you're parenting. You know, sometimes I'm mad at one of my, my kids, and I discipline them because I'm mad, rather than because I want to see them improve. I'll say that again just to kind of wrap your mind around that. Sometimes I discipline because I'm mad, rather than because I want to see them improve. Now, if I want to see someone improve, I'm going to take a very different response than just because I'm mad, right? I'm not going to, if I want to see them improve, I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to take a very thoughtful approach. Not that there's not a discipline there, but I'm not going to snap at them. I'm not going to hit them, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to rush, rush into the situation. I'm going to stop, step back and think, what's best for this person? And what do I need to do? How do I lay down my own desires, my own needs to do what's best for this person? That's the greater purpose in this situation. So you take this and you magnify it up, right? Whether your greater purpose is, is your faith and, and, and God. For me, that's, that's a big thing as a Christian. Maybe it's your organization mission. Maybe it's your it's a relationship. Maybe it's your customer. Whatever that greater purpose is. And you probably have multiple ones playing into every conversation at every time. How can you graciously pursue that greater purpose knowing that you're fallible and they're fallible, but we're moving somewhere together and we're doing our best. We're getting better. We're growing. We don't have to hide our faults. But we're trying to use everything we have to accomplish this purpose that is so important. It's worth laying our life down. We're sacrificing. We're dying to ourselves every day to accomplish it. This is what humble leadership looks like. This is my shorthand for it. GPGP, GP, greater pursuit of a greater purpose. This is kind of how I keep this in mind for myself. Maybe it's helpful for you, you know, to write that down and think about that. How do you bring that the GPGP GP into your life? So why is this important? Let's go back to this again. We've talked a lot about it. It's theoretical. But if you don't actually buy into this, again, you all you know, probably are familiar with Colin's work, but humility is probably not the top of your list. So let's reiterate again why humility and humble leadership is so important. The macro level, again, we see this great performance from great companies, but What's going on under the hood here? How does this actually work? Again, it's kind of abstract, so let's make it a little more concrete. And I'm just going to talk about three specific outcomes of humility and humble leadership. I'm working on a book on this, and there'll be a lot more about this in the book, but just three little nuggets for you today. The, the first outcome of humility and humble leadership is personal well-being. Okay? Humility benefits you, makes you feel better, makes your life a lot better. Uh, research shows, and you can see the citations down there, that, that humble people have higher life satisfaction and happiness. Let's just think about that for a second. Why might that be? Why might humble people be more satisfied and happier with life? Well, if I am self-aware and recognize my strengths and limitations and I've accepted that, I don't feel like I have stuff to hide. I don't feel like I have stuff to prove. I don't feel like I have things to lose, right? Sure, I've got something I'm working toward, but I'm not always just playing a shell game and trying to hide what's going on, right? I just, life is what it is and I do my best with what I have. They also have decreased depression and anxiety because they recognize there's a purpose way bigger than myself, right? There's bigger stuff going on, things I don't have control over. I don't have to control it. And when I let go of the need to control what I can't control, I feel a lot less anxiety about the things I can't control. Go figure that. So there's this personal impact. There's also a team impact. Um, first of all, just imagine if the, the only thing was the top layer, if the only thing was that those individual well-being, what would it be like to work for that leader? who is secure, who's happy, who's not anxious. What do you think team meetings go like whenever you have a budget crisis? If that person's not like worked up into a froth, you think you make better decisions and actually enjoy those conversations a bit more? You think you maybe go out of your way to work with that leader versus to avoid that leader? If that was all there was, this would be worth going. But there's more. There's more than this. Humble leaders build stronger teams because, again, if I recognize my strengths and my limitations, I can draw out the, the strengths of other people and say, hey, I don't know all the answers to this question. I don't need to pretend like I do. Who has insight? You, what do you think? You know, drawing out those perspectives. So teams learn better under humble leaders. Not surprisingly, as a result, engagement goes up, job satisfaction goes up, turnover goes down. Because people realize, I don't have to appear to have it all together. I just got to keep working at this. I got to get better. I got to be open uh, to criticism, open to feedback. It's about the mission. It's not about me or my ego or protecting my kingdom. When that happens, teams work more effectively. And the bottom line, number three, is superior firm performance. A study of 105 software companies found that, that companies led by humble leaders had increased returns on assets over time because of all the stuff we've talked about, right? People are engaged. Teams are high functioning. They're willing to, to uh, offer challenges to each other because they know that you know, it's not just about who looks best. It's about getting the best result, not just about who gets the credit. All this stuff drives to the bottom line. So again, any one of these things would be enough to, to want to focus on humble leadership. But you've got all this and tons more, ton of reason to, to care about humble leadership. Now here I think is the real question. This all sounds great, right? Okay, maybe, maybe I've convinced you that humility is important and you think, okay, yes, I, I should be a humble leader. We all should be, right? We should also be more loving and more patient, but none of us have a plan to become more patient, right? That's what you have kids for. 
just takes care of that for you. Um, but practically, what can you do today? Because today is the action day of the conference, right? How do you put this stuff into action? What can you practically do today to become a humble leader? Before I talk about the things that you can do, I want to talk about a mindset, because there's a, a really big barrier to, to becoming humble that is a mindset. And that's that when you look at anything that's this, uh, this magnitude of scale, it was like a character change. You think, oh my gosh, I'm not a patient person. I can never become a patient person. I'm not a humble person. I can never become a humble person. And you just don't even try. But just like anything in life, there's this combination of, of do and become that interplays together. And here's the way it works. Let's say you want to become a runner. You say, you know what? I, my family's runners. I want to become a runner. I think it'd be cool to be a runner and be healthy that way. What's the first step you take to be a runner? Buy the tennis shoes, right? Yeah, buy the t so you buy the tennis shoes. And you think, you know what? I think I need some running gear. So you go buy the running gear. And then you watch some running videos. And you buy some, you know, app technology to track yourself. So you spend thousands of dollars and tons of hours. Are you actually a runner yet? No, you're not a runner. What makes you a runner? Running, running makes you a runner. So you go for one run. Are you a runner? You go for two runs. Are you a runner? Three runs. You've gone for running three days in a row. Would you call yourself a runner? You're starting, though, to take these steps, right? After you've run like four or five days in a row, you're like, you know what? I think maybe I'm a runner. You know, after six, seven, eight days, after five weeks, it's like, hold, hold on, now I'm a runner. You started doing, and now you've become. And guess what? Now, because I'm a runner, well, I run, right? I mean, I run because I'm a runner. Well, you didn't start off that way. You started by just taking a run. It's the same thing, too. Like, you want to be a non-smoker. How do you be a non-smoker? You read books about non-smoking, whatever, whatever. Okay, yeah, sure, do that stuff, but stop smoking today. Like, smoke one less time today. You're now more of a non-smoker than you were before. And, and one fewer cigarette, one fewer pack, and all of a sudden you're a non-smoker. You want to become a purpose-driven person. That's great. Go to a conference. That's awesome. Sure. How can you actually live on purpose today? How can you take one step to become a little more purposeful today? As you do that, you become that. And as you become that, you do it again. And it just accelerates and accelerates and accelerates again and again. It gets easier and easier as you go. So this is the key. The key thing is is rather than looking at the enormity of the task of like, I feel like I'm so arrogant or I'm so insecure and, and I, I couldn't be humble, just think, what's one step I could take today to become more humble? And there's two different things I want to talk about that kind of accelerate this flywheel. There's perceptions and there's practices. And you know, there's a lot I could cover here, but I'm just going to cover one of each um, for the sake of time today. Perceptions and practices. So here's the first perception, and that is gratitude, thankfulness. This is a quote from Michael Ramsey. He says, thankfulness is a soil in which pride does not easily grow. Thankfulness is a soil in which pride does not easily grow. Let's think about this for a second. Why might this be the case? Why might thankfulness root out humility or, or root out pride and keep it from growing and, and promote, promote humility? Well, if I'm thankful for the blessings in my life, especially the things that I didn't earn, you know, I think about being born into a family that my parents are still together, and I was, I was cared for as I grew up. You know, my, my parents had books in the house, like stuff like that, those privileges that I was offered. I realized, oh my gosh, sure, I've accomplished stuff. I got a PhD before I was 30. You know, I, I, I do full-time speaking and work with leaders on five continents. That's great, right? But that foundation came from somewhere, and it came from people that outside of me that I had no control over. I recognized, holy cow, that's humbling to recognize I'm standing on the shoulders of someone else. And then I think beyond that are the things I have accomplished, the gifts I have and the way I have you know, chances to, to offer value to others. And it makes me so grateful that I get to have life-changing leadership conversations with people all over the world every day. When my dad was working a no-collar job, crawling under houses or on top of houses just to pay the bills, right? It's like, I'm so grateful for that. And when I'm grateful for those things, I'm less likely to be arrogant, less likely to be proud. And if I go beyond myself and I'm thankful for other people, I look at the people in my life who love me despite the fact that I am hard to love sometimes. I look at the people in my life who are great at the things that I'm terrible at and that, you know, shore up some of those weak spots for me. And I, I recognize their strengths. Again, I'm humbled by what they have to offer and how lucky I am to be in those rich relationships. So thankfulness cultivates the spirit of humility. So ask yourself today, what could I do to become a little bit more thankful today? So that's the first piece, is, is the, the perception, the perception of thankfulness. This is 100% in your control, what you choose to do to become thankful for. Here's the, the, the second thing, is a practice. The first was a perception, this is a practice. And, and it's a concept called respectful inquiry, uh, from two researchers, uh, Quakebeck and, and Phelps. 
And respectful inquiry is all about asking questions, but not just any questions, and not just any questions in any way. It's, it's not closed-ended questions like, hey, can you be here tomorrow? Or leading questions like, do you think you could do it this way? Um, it's a very specific kind of questions. And there's three factors here. It's a high volume of open questions framed by active listening. A high volume of open questions framed by active listening. In other words, I'm asking you a lot of questions. They're open-ended to really draw out your perspective. And I'm actually listening to you before, during, and after that question. Now, you might be thinking, what in the world does that have to do with humility? <laughs> How is this connected at all to humble leadership? Well, let's just think about this for a second. How might this require humility? Well, if I'm asking you a question, what does that presume? I don't know the answer, right? I'm showing a chink in my armor. Wait, you're asking me? You're the CEO. You're asking someone on the front line what the problem is? I thought you were supposed to know this. That's the narrative we have in our head when we ask that question oftentimes, is it's showing my vulnerability. This is actually not true at all. What, what happens when the CEO asks someone, what do you think is going on here? How does that person feel? Oh my gosh, like, like they're valued, like they have something to offer. Ironically, the thing that we're most afraid of is what other people need from us the most oftentimes. But it does, it creates vulnerability. I'm showing I don't know the answer, and I'm giving up control of the conversation. Because if I ask you, you could go off in any, any direction, right? I don't have control of the situation again. And one thing that all the leaders I work with are not very good at is letting go, right? Letting go of control. They want to drive the narrative to their outcome, what they have in mind. But if I actually want to understand what's going on, what do I have to do? I've got to ask questions. This is what's so amazing about, about asking questions. It produces three responses in the other person. A sense of control, a sense of competence, and a sense of connection. When I ask you a humble question uh, or, or a respectful inquiry question, you feel in control because you actually take control of the conversation. I put the ball in your court and say, hey, what do you think about this? How do you want to respond? And you get to decide where to go. In that moment, you feel competent because I'm saying you have something to offer that I don't. I, I really want to know your, your perspective, especially if I'm listening to you well. If I'm not listening to you, all this goes out the window, right? The active listening is a critical third piece. And then we also feel connection because what I'm showing is I value our relationship and I care about you as a person and I care about what you think. This is transformational for people. And, and ironically, the bigger the power differential, the more impactful this is, right? So if one of your kids asks you an open question, like, that's nice, right? They care what you think. You know, when, when your boss asks you a question, that's, that's, wow, that's even really nice. You didn't have to ask me. When your CEO, several levels up, asks you a question, like, holy cow, you feel so honored, you know, to be treated that way. This, this step alone creates that sense of humble leadership. And here's what's amazing about this. Again, going back to the do become loop. If we think about the enormity of the task of becoming humble, it's a lot to accomplish there. But just taking this step and saying, okay, you know what? I'm just going to ask, I'm going to do this once today. One person, I'm going to try and, and have a respectful inquiry conversation and, and ask them some questions. Okay, I'm going I'm to try and shut down my internal chatter. You know, stop trying to judge them what they're saying. Not Stop trying to fill in the blanks or lead the conversation, but just really honestly ask them and have a dialogue with them. If I can do that in that moment, it's perceived as humble leadership, right? They see, wow, that, that was kind of surprising that we actually, we never do that. That's, that's amazing. That's really refreshing. And at the same time, it's making me more into a humble leader because as, if I do that, if I'm really listening well, I start to realize, wow, this person actually has a lot to offer. I've never really thought about their perspective. Wow, they, they actually added some really valuable insight. I should go talk to them some more. I'm humbled as I realize, again, my deficiencies and what I, what I lack, which makes me more likely to do it again. This is the do, the become loop in circle, working together in tandem. You do this enough, and you start to become more of that humble leader. So here are the, the three questions I want to spend a few minutes on. And this is really the application that we're driving toward, right? Again, this is all great in theory, but what are you going to do when you walk out of this room in 15 minutes or when you log off Zoom in 15 minutes? And here are those three questions. Number one, what is your greater purpose? If you think about that humble leadership thing, that's great. But if you don't have that greater purpose, if you don't know what you're working toward outside of yourself and your own career advancement, then none of this stuff is really going to work, right? What is the thing that's beyond you? Again, it could be... It could be your faith, it could be your company's mission, it could be a relationship. What is it that is beyond you? Second, who or what should you be thankful for today? Going back to that perception of thankfulness, who are the people in your life that have loved you when you weren't lovable? What are the gifts you've been given? What are the things you've accomplished that you can just celebrate? We don't slow down and take time to be grateful enough, right? We're, we're driven people, we're on to the next thing, we wanna accomplish great things, and that's wonderful, but if we don't slow down and be thankful, and when is it ever going to be enough? 
When are we ever going to just feel satisfied? And lastly, number three, who do you need to listen to today? Who do you need to ask questions of to glean their insight? Maybe because they have some information you don't have and it's going to help you solve a problem. Maybe because you want to honor them and give them those feelings of control, of competence and connection because you know that you've kind of brushed past them and not considered them the way you want to consider them. You want to become more humble in that relationship. Let me give you just a second. If, if you have thoughts about this, I'd love to hear your thoughts. How, how would you answer one of these three questions? What thoughts come to mind for you? Thanks, Adam. So, so Adam said his greater purpose is to, is to make an impact, to make connections, to solve problems that, that make an impact. Is that right? Yeah. 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 That's how I define my purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could, you, could you give them the mic? Yeah, that'd be great. So, so what would that lead you to do, uh, approach relationships differently than if it was just all about building the, the Adam Ritchie kingdom? <laughs> yeah, no. Is, this, is it working? Perfect. Yeah. Um, it would really, it really drives me to make decisions a little bit differently because I'm very other centric or others focused because I know that I'm trying to help others make an impact, yeah. right? It, and it's not self-serving. Yeah. So that's kind of the way I try to live my life. It yeah. doesn't always work. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. For those of you online who can't hear, they're saying that it's, it's noticed. That Adam's not just making this up. There actually is some truth to this. Yeah, it's going back to what we talked about, about that example of, um, you know, do, am I going to choose to do what I want to do or what's best for the other person? And those can be very different approaches. Yeah. And, and we don't often stop and just think, am I doing what's best for them or am I doing what I want to do? Yeah, yeah. that's great. Another insight? So someone else who would know how to answer one of these three questions, have an initial idea about how they want to answer it? <laughs> no, and I, these these three questions are real powerful. And I had an um, experience with that. Uh, who do you need to listen to today? Most recently, I had to call somebody. Our our manager was on vacation, so I had to call someone who reported to her to ask a question about something to respond to a customer. And wow, I was I um, humbled at mm -hmm. the knowledge and the um, and the clarity that she was able to give me to answer the question I needed to get back to the customer. And that is, it was a great reminder to see this here because I think if, um, if I only remembered to do that a little bit more often, I probably <laughs> would be, um, you know, I, I, and I think it made her feel really, really good too. Mm -hmm. Although I know she was extremely uncomfortable at the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> Why is she calling me? What does she want to know? Because yeah. normally she's used to reporting to somebody yeah. else. So. Yeah. That's great insight, Don. Yeah, what's, what's really fascinating about humble inquiry or respectful inquiry is that the times when we most need to do it are the times when we do it the least. So for instance, we're, let's say you're a leader and you're under tremendous time pressure and you don't have knowledge about the situation. You, you don't want to slow down to ask questions and you don't want to appear incapable. So you don't ask questions. Those are the times when you most need to say, hey, well, I don't know what's going on. Can someone step in here and someone take the lead on this and, and ask those questions? And so even though it's totally counterintuitive, it's like, as you've said, like it's, it's totally powerful whenever you actually pull it off. So just as you talked about earlier with the whole parenting thing, right? Like that hit me hard. Like, mm -hmm. am I am I reprimanding my kid because I'm mad, or am I reprimanding them because I want them to grow? Yeah. Right. And that plays right into that. Who do I need to listen to today? Like, mm -hmm. okay, why did you misbehave? Like, what what was driving that behavior? Instead of you know sending sending them to their room. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's that was awesome insight. Yeah. And just, and just that question itself, like what's best for them versus what I want to do, if you only did that for the rest of your life, right? And we're going to mess it up, right? We're, we're going to misjudge what we think is best for the person. We're not going to understand their motivations or intentions, right? But if you just started there, think about how that would change your life. Or maybe more easily, think about how nice it would be if other people cared about your, <laughs> your perspective and tried to do it to you. How nice that would be. What would it be if we did that for other people? Yeah. No, thank you all for sharing. So I want to invite you just in, the, in, in some of the time we have. We've got a little bit, a few minutes here, just to. 
Yeah, take some time and just write down some thoughts about this. So as you walk out, what is it that you want to commit to today along these lines? Do you need to clarify your purpose? If so, what are you going to do for that? You know, are you going to be thankful for someone? Who was that? We're going to write that out right now. And is there someone you need to listen to? What steps do you want to take there? We'll just pause for just a minute, give you a chance to do that. So I'm going to draw us to conclusion here. We've talked about a lot. Hopefully you got some ideas that really sparked in your mind. Uh, speaking of spark, if you want to continue the conversation, I have a, a three-minute podcast that goes every other week that has, has like one little leadership nugget in it. If you want to subscribe and, and uh, keep these things going, you can do that. Uh, also keep you up to date on where I'm at with my book as I work on this book on humble leadership. It'd be a great way to, to subscribe there. But before I do that, I want, to, I want to just leave you with a quote that we can kind of chew on as we wrap up here. This is uh, known as the, the prayer of St. Francis, one little piece of this. And I think this really captures the heart of humble leadership. It's, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. In other words, let my goal not be, how do I get consolation? How do I get love? How do I get understanding? Like, hey, take some time to understand me. In, in contrast, as, as Stephen Covey famously says, seek first to understand rather than to be understood. And what do we all know? If we really step back and think about this, when we take time to love other people rather than feel loved, what kind of response do we get as a result? We get love. When we take time to understand other people, what do we get in response from them? We get understanding, right? When we have this greater purpose outside ourselves, something bigger than us, this relationship, this person, this cause we want to advance, and we're really pursuing that with everything we have, we get so much more back in return than we could possibly give. So much more back. So as you leave today, you get a lot to, to take in from the Purpose Summit, a lot of high, high-minded ideals about pursuing purpose. I want you to think at a really pr- critical, practical level, how can I listen better? How can I be more thankful today? And, and do this all in pursuit of a greater purpose. If you do that, I promise you, you'll start that do-become loop. As, as you do these things, you'll become more humble, which makes it easier to do the humble things. Not only will your life get better, but you'll impact everyone in your circle in a positive, life-changing kind of way. And maybe, just maybe, You'll outperform the market by seven times and uh, make it in Jim Collins' next book. But uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your time today.